To Madame de Tesse, Nîmes, March 20th, 1787. Here I am, madam, gazing whole hours at the Maison Carré, like a lover at his mistress. The stocking weavers and silk spinners around it consider me a hypochondriac Englishman, about to write with a pistol the last chapter of his history. This is the second time I have been in love since I left Paris. The first was with a Diana at the Chateau de Lay Epinay in Beaujolais, a delicious morsel of sculptor by M. A. Slods. This, you will say, was a rule to fall in love with a female beauty, but with a house? It is out of all precedent. No, madam, it is not without a precedent in my own history. While in Paris I was violently smitten with the Hotel de Somme, and used to go to it to the Tuileries almost daily to look at it. The Lossus de Chaises, inattentive to my passion, never had the compliance to place a chair there, so that sitting on the parapet and twisting my neck round to see the object of my admiration, I generally left it with a torticolli. From Lyon to Nîmes I had been nursed with the remains of Roman grandeur. They have always brought you to mind, because I know your affection for whatever is Roman and noble. At the end I thought of you, but I am glad you were not there, for you would have seen me more angry than I hope you will ever see me. The Praetorian Palace, as it is called, comparable for its fine proportions to the Maison Carré, defaced by the barbarians who have converted it into its present purpose, its beautiful fluted Corinthian columns cut out in part to make space for Gothic windows, and hewed down in the residue to the plane of the building, was enough, you must admit, to disturb my composure. At Orange, too, I thought of you. I was sure you had seen with pleasure the sublime triumphal arch of Marius at the entrance of the city. I went then to the Rhine. Would you believe, madam, that in this eighteenth century in France, under the reign of Louis the Sixteenth, they are at this moment pulling down the circular wall of this superb remain, to pave a road, and that too from a hill which is itself an entire mass of stone, just as fit and more accessible? A former intendant, uh, Monsieur de Baville, has rendered his memory dear to the traveller and amateur by the pains he took to preserve and restore those monuments and antiquity. The present one, I do not know who he is, is demolishing the object to make a good road to it. I thought of you again, and I was then in great good humour at the Pont de Garde, a sublime antiquity, and well preserved. But most of all here, where Roman taste, genius, and magnificence excite ideas analogous to ours at every step, I could no longer oppose the inclination to avail myself of your permission to write you, a permission given with too much compliance by you, and used by me with too much indiscretion. Madame de Tot did me the same honour, but she, being only the descendant of some of those puny heroes who boiled their own kettles before the walls of Troy, I shall write to her from a Grecian rather than a Roman canton, when I shall find myself, for example, among her Phoenician relations at Marseilles. Loving as you do, madam, the precious remains of antiquity, loving architecture, gardening, a warm sun and a clear sky, I wonder you have never thought of moving Cheville to Nîmes. This, as you know, has not always been deemed impracticable, and therefore the next time a sur intendant de Batemont de Roy, after the example of Monsieur Colbert, sends persons to Nîmes to move the Maison Carré to Paris, that they may not come empty-handed, desire them to bring Cheville with them to replace it. Apropos of Paris, I have now been three weeks from there without knowing anything of what has passed. I suppose I shall never meet it at Aix, where I have directed my letters to be lodged post Risson. My journey has given me leisure to reflect on this assembly de notables. Under a good and a young king, as the present, I think good may be made of it. I would have the deputies then by all means so conduct themselves as to encourage him to repeat the calls of this assembly. Their first step should be to get themselves divided into two chambers instead of seven, the noblesse and the commons separately. 
the second to persuade the king, instead of choosing the deputies of the common himself, to summon those chosen by the people for the provincial administrations. The third, as the noblesse is too numerous to be all of the assembly, to obtain permission for that body to choose its own deputies. Two houses so elected would contain a mass of wisdom which would make the people happy and the king great, would place him in history where no other act can possibly place him. They would thus put themselves in the track of the best guide they can follow. They would soon overtake it, become its guide in turn, and lead to the wholesome modifications wanting in that model and necessary to constitute a rational government. Should they attempt more than the established habits of the people are right for, they may lose all and retard indefinitely the ultimate object of their aim. These, madam, are my opinions, but I wish to know yours, which I am sure will be better. From a correspondent at Nîmes, you will not expect news. Were I to attempt to give you news, I should tell you stories one thousand years old. I should detail to you the intrigues of the courts of the Caesars, how they affect us here, the oppressions of their praetors, prefects, etc. I am immersed in antiquities from morning to night. For me, the city of Rome is actually existing in all the splendor of its empire. I am filled with alarms for the event of the interruptions daily, making on us by the Goths, the Visigoths, Ostrogoths, and Vandals, lest they should reconquer us to our original barbarism. If I am sometimes induced to look forward to the eighteenth century, it is only when recalled to it by the recollections of your goodness and friendship, and by those sentiments of sincere esteem and respect with which I had the honor to be, madam, your most humble and most obedient servant. Thomas Jefferson